Hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of the MLOps Community Podcast Coffee Sessions. Today, I'm on my own. I don't have any Vishnu, no David, but I do have an incredible guest, Anne Kokus, the Director of Data Science at Iggy, a company doing some fascinating stuff with data, more specifically geospatial data, came to talk with me about everything that they're doing and more. So why is geospatial data different for machine learning? What are some common challenges that teams face when needing to work with this data? Anne goes into detail about what Iggy is doing to combat these headaches data scientists can face while working with geospatial data challenges. Anne also shares some of her mistakes when putting the Iggy product into existence and trying to find the ever illustrious product market fit. She also mentions some rituals that she has found so that data scientists and engineers play nicer together. I want to make something clear before we put this podcast out there. This in no way was sponsored by Iggy. I am just completely fascinated by what they're doing. And I believe the pains that they're trying to solve are relevant to many of the people that listen to this. So I wanted to talk with them and hear the story, hear about how Iggy was created from an a data scientist at Airbnb who realized that this was really a problem and wanted to go out and tackle the challenge. If you want to test out Iggy, you can jump over to askiggy.com or find the link for that below in the description. Last thing that I will say before we jump in to the full conversation that I had with Anne We don't ask for much around here at the MLOps community, but it would mean the world to myself and the whole team if you're finding any value in any of these podcasts that we are doing to subscribe to the show and stay up to date with all of the latest in MLOps. That's all I got for now. Let's hear it from Anne. Anne, it is a Pleasure to have you on here. I am excited to talk to you about geospatial data and everything that comes with that. Also, what you're doing at Iggy right now sounds fascinating. So I want to get into all of it. But I think it's worth starting from the beginning and getting a little bit of your story and how you started out in this business of data and ML. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, thanks so much for having me. It's It'll be a great conversation. Um, yeah, I started out actually uh, in data, you know, after um, college, I did a computer science degree. And I, at that fo- time, I was kind of focused on information security and had sort of two classes to fill at the end. And there were classes open in computational linguistics and machine learning. And I was like, well, that sounds kind of cool. And this was like 2007. So, I, you know, I took them and I was like, wow, this is really cool stuff and just kind of got hooked. Um, and then after that, I spent uh, eight years in the Navy as an intel officer and just saw like so many opportunities where there was low hanging fruit, where a little bit of ML applied in the right way could have saved us so much time. You know, and at that point, I had like just enough information to feel like I could do anything with it. So, um, you know, when, when I left, uh, I knew that that's kind of what I wanted to go back to. So I en- ended up eventually doing a PhD um, focused on NLP and specifically semantics. So, you know, how do you get computers to understand words and phrases in a way you can use to make inference? Um, and then, you know, I worked at uh, in big pharma for, for a little while um, and worked sort of also uh, during, during my PhD sort of part-time um, in applied ML at, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and then I met Lindsay, who's the CEO of Iggy, um, and she had this really cool idea to kind of take the things um, that I've been doing in machine learning in NLP and and semantics and kind of apply some of those models to geospatial. So um, I had done some geospatial work in the Navy, you know, worked a lot with map data data and trying to build 
um, sort of these maps of where we thought threats might be. And so, you know, I, I kind of had that background and understood immediately kind of the light bulb went off like, wow, you know, we can we can represent words with with vectors, we can represent images with vectors, but like there's not that much work now in representing geography that way. So um, it just seemed like such a cool opportunity to, to try this new thing. Um, and that's how I ended up here. Excellent. I want to get into Iggy in just a bit, but first let's talk a little bit about that experience in the Navy. And it seems like what, so it was around 2010 you were there or 2009? Uh, like 2007 to 13 is really the bulk of my time. Yeah. So that's super early in the machine learning world, right? And right. you were using different kinds of machine learning at that time. And what were the use cases? If you can tell us without having yeah, to kill yeah, us. Yeah. No, we actually, we actually weren't. Um, and that was the problem. So I mean, we were doing things like, uh, you know, we would get these reports in um, about things that were happening in the world. Um, I, like one good example is we happened, I happened to be on deployment during um, the terror attacks in Mumbai in 2008, I guess, around November 2008. And so we were, you know, our job was kind of to keep the commanders informed of what was going on because we were, we were very close. Um, and so we were getting these reports in all the time and they were all in text and we were reading them manually and then we were going and plotting things on a map. And um, somebody had this, this software that was this new software that's supposed to do um, geospatial resolution. So read the name of a place and then pin it on the map for you. And so we're like, great, let's try this and see if it works. But the problem was one of the main sites that was getting attacked was this place called the Taj Mahal Hotel. And so, you know, every time it saw that, it would plot it in Agra where the Taj Mahal is and not in Mumbai where this hotel was. And so, you know, that, that was like one situation where it's like, well, you know, this tool is really helpful, but it's really kind of rule-based and, you know, doesn't take that much context to in, into account. And there's like a lot we can do with machine learning to understand, you know, all the other places in this document are about Mumbai. So maybe it's more likely that it's this place in Mumbai than in Agra. Um, and so there were just like countless examples like that where um, I kind of saw, you know, potential for it. Mm. And so then you started working with, I mean, what were you doing in the beginning there? It was mainly trying to augment this rule-based system or did you go into analytics? Were you jumping right off the deep end and doing some machine learning and then figuring uh, that out? Yeah, not so much at that time. I mean, then we were just kind of trying to keep our head above water, you know, trying to process everything in as it came in. Um, I would say more that this time in my life was like a period where I had a lot of ideas about how things could be better. Um, and so, you know, kind of those helped inform what I decided to do after I eventually, you know, moved on to a different career. Yeah. Cause you said you were working with geospatial data, right? And yeah. maybe that's a good segue into the quirks of geospatial data and why yeah. it's not exactly the easiest to work with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, there are, there are a lot of reasons. I think data engineering is a big part of it. Um, you know, going back to like that experience being on the ship with geospatial data, like the transfer or ingesting geospatial data then meant we loaded up uh, these huge metal boxes with like 40 pounds of hard drives and carried them up the pier and down into the ship and put them in the server. Um, we've come a long way since oh then, um, but things are still like, things are still complicated, right? So, um, you know, in, in terms of data engineering, geospatial data comes a lot of time in proprietary formats, um, like shapefiles. So like a lot of even open data, so government data, you know, it, it's it's open, but it's only open if you have that type of software to read it, right? Um, and it also comes in a lot of open formats. There's been a great, you know, open geospatial community that have made things like GeoJSON available. Um, but still, you know, there it, I think for, for, some for some teams, it seems like this is a very, different type of data, I'm not quite sure how to work with it. Um, then there are also things like joins, right? So let's say I'm I'm trying to bring in some census data and it comes to me where everything is linked to this census block group, right? Which is like, you know, a couple square blocks of, of area. Um, and maybe I'm trying to, you know, append this, this, this census data, like how many people are between the ages of 25 and 29 to a house. Which, which has a, an address. And so there's this problem of like, how do I figure out which census block group this address is in? Um, and then there are even things with like uh, projections. So uh, maybe this house, I also wanna know how far is it to the coastline and I can get this coastline shape file and that's great. Um, and I need, maybe I know how to like calculate the distance from an address to a point or for, to a line. 
Um, but maybe that coastline comes in a geographic format and I need to put it into a projected format so that I can actually calculate a straight line distance that way. Um, lots, of, lots of different like per, sort of quirks um, that I think, you know, for, for some folks who are not, uh, don't have that background or don't have team members with that background, it might, it might seem a bit daunting and like maybe too much of a hurdle if you just want to do some quick experimentation. So mm -hmm. maybe I don't know whether that adding that coastline distance is going to help or not. But it seems like now it's going to take six weeks for me to get there. So hmm. maybe we'll just go on to the next thing. It's interesting how you notice that or how you mention that this is really a data engineering kind of thing. And it makes complete sense. And I'm wondering how, because you talked about in the old days, you were lugging around these 40 pound cases with a bunch of hard drives in them. And obviously it's not like that right now. But what have you seen as the evolution in this space from those days when you were on the ship to now when you're at Iggy? Yeah. Um, so, you know, at Iggy, we're really lucky in that a lot of our team um, has very strong data engineering backgrounds. I guess that's, that's no accident. Um, but I think there's kind of this confluence now between um, sort of an intersection between some machine learning and data engineering tooling and geospatial. So, for example, we use BigQuery a lot um, as our backend for... Um, not only, you know, ingesting and storing data, but also manipulating it. Um, and BigQuery now supports geographic data types and geographic functions. Um, I think there are also good libraries in, in Spark um, and other, other platforms. Um, so that's one thing that's really changed. Um, I also think, you know, a lot of the geospatial work to date um, has really focused on mapping and making it easy to make pretty maps with geospatial data. Um, and so a lot of those things have been written in languages like JavaScript. And now there are, you know, you can you can take these big data platforms like BigQuery and you can write user-defined functions in JavaScript. So there already exists lots of libraries for working and manipulating um, geospatial data in JavaScript that you can use there. So I think it's kind of this confluence of things that are coming together um, to, to get us to a place now where, you know, it's, it's very manageable for us to work with geospatial data at scale. Yeah, I can see that. So the evolution has really been helpful and makes life a lot easier, I'm sure, than when you were back on the ship. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about Iggy and what the story is there, because I find it fascinating what you all are doing. And we spoke before about it, but I think it's worth going into a little background on what exactly Iggy is and what are the problems you're trying to solve? Yeah, so um, Iggy was started, I guess, about a year and a half ago. Um, our CEO, Lindsay, was uh, a data scientist at Airbnb. Um, and sort of the, the canonical Iggy story is she was working on things like these property description pages where you have a listing and there's informa information about that listing. And they were trying to do things like, you know, figure out how far some property is from the beach. And what they had to work with was the 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 um, the owner's descriptions of the property, and you know that's great. A lot of them mention that it's close to the beach, but some people might be in LA and they say they're close to the beach, but it takes 20 minutes to drive there. So they're trying to get some kind of like ground truth. And you know, Lindsay thought, well, we have map data, we have maps, we can measure this. Um, but at that point, for for her team, it was just sort of too big an infrastructure lift to try that. Um, and so, you know, coming out of that experience, I think she saw then many more uh, circumstances where um, it just like geospatial seemed a little bit more hard than it had to be. And so Iggy was born as a, a company to try to make it really easy for developers and data scientists to get uh, insight from geospatial information into their their products and their, in their uh, analysis. And it seems like that wouldn't or it shouldn't be such a big problem or such a hard problem. Why was that like such a heavy lift that Airbnb said, yeah, we're going to pass on trying to figure it out that way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think she can tell the story much better than I can, but I imagine it's for all those those sort of reasons that I stated before. So, you know, somebody would have to like pull the shape files and, you know, put them into their database in a way that they could then do these spatial calculations, these distance calculations and um, you know, that for, sometimes for, for teams that haven't worked with that before, it might seem like, you know, that's, it's just new learning and, and everybody likes to do that, but it might just be, you know, not a priority. Yeah. That's a great point that you mentioned too, is that it can be really daunting to try and work with the geospatial data, especially if you've never done it before. 
-hmm. Are there things that you've recognized are best practices within this field? Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, I think like web, web-based web uh, mapping has come a long way. There are sort of standards and the sorts of projections people use. Um, I think there are also, you know, there are other companies who who aim to make it easier to work with geospatial data sort of in a very geospatial context. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think one of the things that makes it tough is, um, like there's, there's not, a, a, there's, I guess there's not like an easy way to take some of the geospatial data and bring it directly into the tooling that data scientists are used to working with, right? Like bring it right into, um, uh -huh. uh, you know, a, a data frame or bring it, you know, in, in the format that you need that sort of already has had all these joins and, and aggregations done around it. So, I mean, that's really what we're trying to do is, um, you know, make it very easy for somebody to say, okay, I have this address. Um, you know, tell me you know, all these things about it. Tell me how far it is from the beach. Tell me how many restaurants are in five minutes walking distance. How does that compare to other houses within the same zip code? Um, all sorts of things like that. Just make that sort of as easy as, as an API call rather than this whole infrastructure lift. Well, I talked to you before about this and my understanding of what you all are doing is it's like data specifically like geospatial data as a service in a way but you mentioned it's kind of like features yeah. in, as a service too and it's not quite a feature store maybe you can break down how you see what it is and how it's not one or the other it's not quite in a specific category sure sure so i think what it is is um you know, the ability to take any sort of field you have in your data that's related to location. It might be an address, it might be an IP address, it might be a zip code, it might even be a county name or a, or a state name. Um, and based on that, you know, sort of key, um, be able to enrich that row of data with thousands of additional features that pertain to that location. And those types of data might include a lot of things. So it could include like what businesses and points of interest are nearby and what's the relation to this place, um, you know, to, in comparison to those. It might include census data. It might include um, even things like news or events, sort of what's happening around here. Um, and so, so trying to like make it much easier for people to access these types of information in a way that's focused on location. Um, yeah. And then, oh, go ahead. No, sorry. As I, I say, it's off. sort of like, yeah. Um, and then feature stores, I think, are sort of similar, right? Like you have an entity and you store features about that entity and you can retrieve them um, and share them among members of the team. And you can also discover new features. Um, I think, you know, what we're doing is similar in the sense that your entity now is this place, whether it's the address or it's the zip code. Um, and you can retrieve lots of features about that. I think what we're not doing yet is sort of the feature discovery necessarily um, or the, uh, yeah, um, but but we hope to eventually get there. Like one of the things we're trying to figure out now is you know, how do we make it really easy for people? We have you know thousands of features we can present and probably not everybody's going to want all of those. So trying to figure out, you know, how do we make the user experience such that it's really easy to find exactly what you're looking for? Yeah, in a way, it feels like it's almost data enrichment mm -hmm. and you're making certain things. Like you said, you have so much data on points or mm -hmm. like the original piece of the data, you can go and say, well, we've got all this other information in case you want it. And right. how does it look from the user's perspective? Does a user download all of this data? Do they talk to you about it? Is, are you like managing a service? How does that work for the end user? Yeah. So, I mean, we're still very early stages and still totally figuring all of those things out um, in the way that's going to make the most sense for, for most users. Um, but I see really two paradigms. One is, you know, some, and this is the way I think a lot of sort of data vendors work is uh, we have these bulk files. Um, we make it easy for you. We show you how to join your data to our bulk files and you can take them. Great. Um, another way though, is, you know, we enrich your data. So, uh, maybe you come to us with this list of addresses, you pass them into our platform, and then we do those joins for you and you can download it easily. I think that second method is also really helpful, especially in the data exploration phase where people might not be sure, like, is this something that is going to be helpful for me? Is this something I want to use? And just the ability to sort of upload a couple of locations, see what comes back, visualize what comes back, play around with that, 
get a sense for, do I trust this data? Is this something that's going to help me? Um, that's where that's, you know, really critical. Yeah. And without having to do all that work, right? Yeah, like, exactly. It sounds oh so nice that you can just send off my data to get it all taken care of. And then I get it back in this nice clean file and I can realize if there is something worth chasing after. And yeah, so yeah. It, it makes sense. Yeah, we, yeah. Yeah. We want to shrink the time, you know, from hypothesis to, to answer really. Yeah, I could see that. So how do you get this data? And you mentioned there's a lot of people on your team that are data engineers that mm -hmm. are very strong in that field. What does it look like for you all on this back end? Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of sort of the drudge work that other teams are doing too. Um, there's nothing really, you know, special or glamorous in it. So we hunt down these files. Um, we try to figure out, you know, what is the best source for something like public libraries. We look at all the files we can find. Um, and then we do some some sort of evaluation, try to try to figure out, you know, which of these sources is best. Do we combine multiple sources to come up with sort of an overall public library data set, or do we just take one or the other? Um, and some of that evaluation involves, you know, if we have some ground truth somewhere, you know, if we know a location or we have, you know, some other data source that we kind of really trust, can we, you know, look at the precision and recall of these places compared to that? Um, we also look at things like coverage. So you know, how how much, right now we're focused on the U.S., so how much of the U.S. does this cover and is it what we would expect based on sort of the distribution of population and other things? Um, and so then we we pull it in and there's a lot of cleaning, you know, finding columns, you know, one data set might have, you know, some binary columns stored as ones and zeros and other binary columns stored as trues and false. And we try to normalize that just like a lot of other, you know, data cleaning exercises go. You talk to me about, flood data that you got from FEMA. And I have it yeah. written down here that I wanted to ask you more about that. Yeah. Can you go into that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so we wanted to make it really easy for people to look up, you know, what sort of flood zone is this place in this latitude and longitude. Um, and that turned out to be sort of a bigger lift than we had, had maybe anticipated for a couple of reasons. So um, just to give some background, so FEMA publishes these flood maps. Um, they're typically done at sort of the county level. Um, originally they've all been done on paper and at some point, you know, in the last uh, over years, they've been digitized and now, you know, most of them are updated and digitized, but there are still some areas of the U S that have only paper maps. Um, so in any case, uh, the way that different localities digitize these, uh, leads to different things. So you might have, for example, like some County might put, um, you know, all of their flood zone a, uh, in one, uh, row of their data set. And so that geographic feature, which is sort of like the, you can think of it like a list of coordinates that, uh, that express every single vertex in that, you know, very potentially very complicated shape. Um, it might have millions and millions of points. And so when you're trying to pull that in, like, first of all, it's too big to pull into a big query row. They won't let you do it. Um, so you have to do a lot of pre-processing to sort of break this down into manageable chunks. You know, do I sort of split this out into a tiled grid? Um, and, and so trying to pull things in that way. Um, it also, you know, had an impact on when we wanted to do queries on the data. So if you have these really big geometries, so you have rows in your data set that are just huge, um, when you want to do a point lookup and say, you know, which row intersects this point, um, having one row like that just slows down the whole thing. So, you know, a lot was involved with trying to figure out sort of the best way to, um, you know, piece that all in smaller chunks that would be much easier to, to work with. Yeah. And again, this goes back to like, you are taking on the headache so that the people that are using Iggy don't have to. And it's so nice that you can specialize so deep into this. And then someone who wants to take advantage of that and piggyback on what you're able to learn from all of this and hopefully accomplish by going through and hitting your head against the wall and working your way through this data that's just insanely complicated to try to manipulate or or do things with then we get to benefit right so it's it's beautiful in that sense and the next question i guess is around what the use cases are right now mm -hmm. for iggy you mentioned that it's more about i mean it came from airbnb and then you're fleshing out this data for certain points 
on a map. What right. are you seeing use cases for? Where do you want to go with it maybe in the future? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I should say our, you know, our primary user that we're focused on are data scientists. So we want to work with data scientists who, you know, maybe have some of these geospatial fields in their data that they're just not leveraging this way. And as you said, you know, make it really easy for them to experiment with it. Um, right now, you know, initially, I think we're focused on real estate use cases. Um, so things like pricing models or propensity to sell. And so we can build these sort of really localized features like how many coffee shops or bus stops are there within 10 minutes walk and how does that compare to other properties in the same zip code. Um, and one thing that we're finding there that's is super interesting for me is that sort of the, the features that matter in these pricing models from a geospatial fan standpoint really vary depending on the location where you are. So like if it, you're in New York or you're in Boston, the number of coffee shops or public transit stops within 10 minutes walk might be really uh, important within your modeling. Um, whereas if we were looking at a data set in Pinellas County, Florida, which is, you know, coastal Florida, um, and those didn't matter so much because things are much more spread out. But what did really matter was um, what is the amount of drivable area within 10 minutes? And that happened to be because the way the land is uh, situated, most of the sort of uh, pricier homes where the price per square foot is higher are out sort of on these, you know, spits of land where the drivable area is, is much less um, within 10 minutes. So, um, you know, everywhere you go, there are different features that matter. And it's really like our goal to sort of let people discover that and, and make that easy to discover because, um, you know, the geography is, is so heterogeneous, heterogeneous. So, um, you know, different features are going to matter in different places. Um, I think, you know, following on from real estate, we we want to bring it to lots of different domains. Um, you know, I used to work in health, in healthcare and public health. Um, and, you know, the hospitals spend a lot of time trying to understand things like, you know, which patients are going to need support getting to their next appointment on time. Or, uh, you know, researchers looking at things like what are environmental factors of health? Like, are there factors of a child's environment that make it more likely for them to develop, develop asthma? Um, and so I think we can help a lot with those sorts of analyses. Um, there, are things, there, there are problems in things like mobility. So if I'm a rideshare company, you know, how, what's, what's somebody willing to pay based on their start and end destination um, and sort of what types of places those are? Or if I'm a bike share company, you know, same thing, or how long do I expect the ride to be based on the start and end location? Um, I think even things like, you know, like e-commerce, if you're trying to do, you know, recommendation systems or understanding users, you know, can I find similarities between users based on the types of locations their IP addresses fall in uh, that I wasn't uncovering before? So I think there are just like, I think this geospatial data is really prevalent in a number of domains. And so I'm hoping that we can touch a lot of them. Yeah, and it feels like it's underutilized because of the headaches that you talked about before. And yeah, so, so it's not being leveraged just because it it may not it's like a lot of squeeze for the juice right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's talk about healthcare real fast because you mm -hmm. were mentioning that and can you go over a few more of those use cases? I didn't quite understand what you were saying. It's like if a doctor wanted to use this data to be able to diagnose things or they could properly tell uh, how certain um, problems like asthma or whatever comes about because there's more people in the area with the asthma. What I, I didn't understand that really. Yeah, Can yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So I guess I was thinking of it more from a research standpoint. Um having worked, you know, at CHOP with these pediatric health researchers, um, there was a big grant at that time when I was working at that hospital um, to do exactly this. So the idea was, you know, we, we know where patients live within Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, we want to understand, like, in addition to um, factors like do people smoke at home or do they have pets? Are there, are there other aspects of the environments where they live that might contribute to them developing asthma? Like, do they live in an area with high air pollution or are they really far from parks and green space? Or is the, um, like the housing density really high? You know, all of these things could potentially, you know, be risk factors. Um, and so as part of that project, I think the, the people on this team were spending just a ton of time trying to get and clean exactly this geospatial data. So we're hoping, you know, this can, can help with projects like that. Um, trying to just speed up research for, for, for folks in that fields like that. 
Yeah. Okay. Now I understand. Yeah. yeah. And that's fascinating to think about and how, again, we're not necessarily looking at it and it's not being utilized and it would be so hard to make correlations by mm -hmm. hand mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to figure that out. But to be able to say with all of this other enriched data that you have about the geospatial location to come up with predictions or theories on what's going on and if there are things that we should be looking at or looking yeah, into exactly. further. Yeah. So I know that you, uh, or how should I put this? I know it hasn't been a cake ride for you this whole time. And I love to ask our guests about different war stories that they've had. Yeah. And yeah. I imagine you've got a few. Uh, yeah. Can you share with us some of your learnings over the years? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, just just at Iggy in the past year, um, you know, we've we've tried a lot of things. So we're still, you know, very early stage. We have 10 employees now um, and still trying to figure out that product market fit. And so I think, you know, initially, um, you know, I, I mentioned the sort of uh, original use case for Iggy and property description pages. Um, but we're also a team of data scientists. And so we sort of understood the capability and, and the um, you know, potential that making geospatial easier to get had for data scientists. Um, and so I think, you know, initially we came out with this API where you could put input a location and basically get all the geographic features back about that location, um, including their geometries. Uh, and it was like, it was a little bit unwieldy. Um, and, you know, we learned from users quickly that I think we, we had been, really in love with this capability. And I think this is probably a trap that a lot of early teams fall into. We've been really in love with this capability um, and trying to make it available for everybody. And as a result, we weren't really focused on one particular user type. Um, and so we learned from users that like, you know, the data scientists weren't really happy and the uh, app developers weren't really happy because we were trying to build for everyone at the same time. So, you know, that was a key learning and we kind of pivoted after that and said, okay, let's just focus on data scientists for now and let's make it really easy for them, you know, in their existing workflows to, you know, I don't know if they're getting data from S3 or someplace else, like let's figure out where they are working and put things there and, and make it easier for them. Um, so that's really one. I think another one was that sort of early on as we were trying to figure out, you know, what, what is this company going to be? Um, some of our, we had, you know, sort of early proofs of concept with various customers. And I think um, sort of early on when we weren't doing a great job articulating, uh, you know, what we brought, I think a lot of folks saw us, saw us as sort of a potentially like a niche data vendor. Um, so we had like one big customer that was um, like a real, relatively big um, iBuyer, you know, trying to get us to, to come up with like very, um, I would say bespoke indices for properties that were based on the topography. So they wanted us to basically, you know, get all of the elevation data for these properties and then calculate very specific things like, you know, how sloped is this property and things like that. Um, and I think we sort of ran this risk of, um, you know, becoming this niche data vendor, which is not a bad thing. You know, there's there's plenty of potential there and, and a lot you can do there. But we just thought, you know, th this overall capability was much more compelling. So, yeah. Yeah, I really like that first one. I mean, both are huge learnings, right? But mm -hmm. that first one is so powerful when it comes to, it It seems to me like you didn't really choose to be on one side or the other. You wanted to have your cake and eat it too. And then yeah. it ended up, you shot yourself in the foot because of it, yeah. because yeah. you were doing both, trying to service both camps, except neither one really was on board. And so how did you make it easier? Like, what did that look like going from this middle way or being stuck in the middle and then saying, all right, we're going to throw everything we've got at the data scientists. What were some actual manifestations of that change? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, initially it involved sort of seeing who came on the platform, following up with them, asking them about what they were using the product for and what things they liked and didn't like. And we found pretty quickly that, you know, the data scientists said, well, you know, I want it easier to pull this data into a data frame or I want just a bulk download. Whereas the app developers are saying, well, these big geometries are coming back and um, they're like too big for me to handle. And, you know, how do I handle the case where I have to... Um, you know, make lots of API calls in one small area, maybe repeatedly, like 
the pricing model wasn't set up to make it easy for them to do that. So, I mean, there are just like so many issues that we learned from, from talking with users. So uh, we kind of regrouped as a team and said, okay, um, what, what, who can we serve uh, in, in the best way with, with the capabilities we have? And, you know, given where we, where we think machine learning is going and, and the potential use of this data in machine learning, um, and also given sort of our background as primarily data scientists, we said, okay, this is a great place to go. So um, practically, you know, we were deprecating the old API. Um, we sort of shifted focus. We started, you know, reaching out to all the data scientists in our network and trying to understand how do they ingest data? Do they work with geospatial data? If they do, great. How do they get it? If not, you know, why not? Um, do they have zip codes in their fields that they're not thinking of this way? Um, and trying to understand sort of the, the, the users. Um, and then also sort of pivoting and focusing the team around building this first product, which is essentially, uh, you know, something where you can input a point and you get back these very hyper-localized features about that point from a variety of data sources, like local points of interest and census data, things like that. Excellent. So I want to kind of shift gears right now and talk a little bit more about your journey and how you've gone from the Navy into the public sector and what that was like, and maybe just some learnings that you've had over the years when it comes to working in the data science field. I know it's changed a ton since 2008 or 2007 when you joined and it's evolved and it went from being what I think they called it the sexiest job in the in <laughs> the world. And now it is seen some people really are are disillusioned with data scientists, I think, because mm -hmm. there have been so many years and so many companies that have tried to bring on a data scientist and not really knowing what they wanted and not really being able to say what it was they were trying to accomplish with this data scientist. And then the project's of course, failed. And so it gave data scientists a bit of a bad rap in that sense. But for you, as your personal journey, what have you found over the years, being a data scientist, being able to make an impact at companies? How have you found, or are there any things that you have found to be very helpful in that sense? Yeah, sure. I think um, you know my role as a data scientist has been very different in the different places that I've been. So in some places I've been more research focused, and it's been sort of this um, sort of retrospective: what can we learn? What um, you know, sort of open-ended research? What sort of models could we be building that we're not? Um, and I think that's a very different job qualitatively from data scientists who work on products and who work with product managers and engineers. Um, I think in the latter case, which is probably, you know, what, what you're mentioning, I think it's just so important that the data scientists work very tightly um, with, with product folks um, in understanding what are the user questions that they're trying to answer and just keeping that, that user at the forefront of their mind and, and in their analysis. Um, I also think, too, I mean, I think one of the, one of the things people like to say uh, about data scientists is like, oh, they really, they just want to like go find the most complicated model and, you know, build this thing in the back and then, you know, maybe it works, maybe it falls totally flat. Um, and so, you know, there have been, you know, times in my career where I've fallen into that trap, certainly. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the big lessons is, and I think this is, you know, sort of, sort of cliche at this point, but just always trying the simplest possible thing first. Like, is there some rule-based model we can apply to the problem that's going to get us 80% of the way there. And we put that into production and we use that as we then start to tinker with the more fun stuff in the background, um, fun from a modeling standpoint. Um, yeah. yeah, I think there are also like different ways that uh, data science teams are organized within organizations. Um, you know, I've been at places where the data scientists are sort of like cloistered off in their own group. Um, and the requirements from the product side or the business side sort of come in through the siphon and they go work on it and then spit back an answer. Um, I think sometimes that, that leads to some of these issues because the communication lag is long. Um, and sometimes the data scientists don't understand clearly what those requirements really are. There's a lot lost in translation there. 
Um, I think teams I've seen where the data scientists are more sort of tightly coupled um, with product teams or with business teams and really have a quick iteration loop where they can, you know, prototype something one day and share it the next and say, is this, is this right? Is this what you're thinking? Um, it just leads to much better products overall and much faster progress. And along those lines, in the exploration phase, as we mentioned, how Iggy can be so useful for that phase, are there any other tips that you have for trying to get something really quick? Because I know it's not always easy to flip something around and give it back Yeah. With, uh, when it comes to working on these hard problems. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, just downscope, 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 like if trying to like get at the heart of what is the hypothesis that we're trying to test, is it, you know, in something like this, is it the hypothesis that the distance to, from a house to the coastline is going to improve our models, uh, error in predicting home price? Um, like what's the smallest experiment I can run that can test that. And maybe that means I only take like a thousand properties from one city and a thousand properties from another city, even if my data set includes, you know, hundreds of thousands throughout the country, um, and just trying it there first to see. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, you know, just, just trying to work with small samples at first, get an idea of which way things are going and then, you know, build up as you get more sure about an answer. Yeah, I can see that. Now the team wise, when you're working on a team, you mentioned being really tight with the product people. And I know also you have to intermingle with data engineers. Mm -hmm. You also may have some machine learning engineers that you're working with. Have you seen anything that is especially helpful along those lines? And there, I asked this because in the community, we have a lot of people that are attacking problems from different backgrounds. There's right. a lot of people from the data science background and you have software engineers who are coming into the machine learning field. You have machine learning engineers and a little bit of everything in between. And one thing that is hard is the idea of having a data scientist creating production level code or being able to code well. And then sometimes there can be tension between mm -hmm. the software engineers and the data scientists. Have you found anything that is particularly useful in that respect? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, so I, th I think there are a couple things. Um, you know, one, uh, I think there's been kind of this tendency in a lot of job postings to like ask data scientists to come in with not only the modeling capability, but also like the ability to, um, you know, put things into a Docker container and deploy it and monitor and, and everything else. Um, I think, you know, those people exist and it's great when they do. Um, but I don't think, especially early on in a career, I don't think people should have to uh, be able to do everything, the full stack from top to bottom. I think what can work really well is when you have a team where the data engineers and data scientists um, are, you know, uh, very um, like basically just boosting each other's capabilities. So what I mean by that is data engineers um, can like focus on the things that they like, which is making things run fast and making things run at large scale. Um, but sort of thinking like the, at the data of the data scientists um, sort of as the users um, and coming up with um, basically like APIs or underlying ways for the data scientists to build these tools um, in a simple way uh, that's going to be repeatable and scalable and, and make it such that, you know, the data scientist doesn't mess something up by um, deploying the wrong container or, um, you know, oh, yeah. uh, like ruining the, the the orchestration pipeline or something. Um, and so I think I've, I've seen teams that work very well that way where, you know, the data scientists and data engineers, you know, talk very specifically about, you know, what's this API that the data scientists need to use? I needed to have a train function. I needed to have a predict function. I needed to have a deploy function, right? And then, um, trying to abstract that as away as much as they can so the data scientists can focus on the things they're really strong in um, and the data engineers can take those requirements and say, okay, now I know they need to do this. How do I, you know, scale this, uh, the compute resources, at, you know, as necessary? How do I, um, you know, deploy these things uh, in a way that, that um, you know, is, is, is repeatable and traceable? So um, I think that's one thing. Um, I think to, um, I mean, a little bit of is just sort of experience. I think, you know, having um, folks who 
maybe have dabbled a little bit in, in both uh, sort of software engineering and data science can be helpful on a team too, um, from both angles, sort of understanding back and forth. Which was exactly the next question that I was going to ask you about mm -hmm. for the ability to build empathy between these different personas and within the team and having the software engineer empathize with the pains and what a data scientist needs to go through. And then the data scientist being able to reciprocate that and yeah. empathize with what a, a SRE or just the, the backend software engineer needs to go through. And so have you found anything? I, I know that some people in the community have recommended doing code reviews or mm -hmm. asking these two to pair program. Is there anything that you've seen that has been helpful in that regard? Um, that doing code reviews back and forth is a really cool idea. Um, I think one thing that that uh, that I've seen that works is sometimes um, as part of onboarding, um, and this is from the data science side, trying to get empathy for you know data engineers or, or SREs is um, you know if they have some sort of process that they use like. Uh, in our case at Iggy, we have these data pipelines, right, where we pull in a new data source, we find it, we clean it, we um, make it, it, we put it into production, essentially. Um, having sort of uh, data scientists work on either pieces of that or like maybe even a whole one if it's, if it's simple enough and sort of small enough scope um, as part of their onboarding is really helpful because then they understand sort of where's their data coming from what is involved, like how much, how much is involved in trying to get it to the state where the data scientists can work with it easily. Um, I think that that really helps. Um, you know, I think from the, from the other side, uh, I've just had like the, a real uh, like fortune to work with um, data engineers and, and SREs who are really interested in machine learning and really interested in data science and they have, you know, on their own, uh, of their own volition, like taken these courses that are online and tried modeling and played around with it. Um, so if there were anything, I would say it was maybe, maybe some of that, you know, as folks are interested, just like dabble in it a little bit. And I, I've been very lucky that, you know, the, the I've worked with really great um, engineers who have done that. And so they understand, you know, um, if I have to scale this machine learning training pipeline across multiple compute resources, here's why. And, um, you know, here, here's, here's sort of what, the, what we're trying to do at the end. Yeah, it's funny you say that because that was one of the comments too. And in this particular thread I'm thinking about in the community Slack about how it's much more common to see software engineers going into the machine learning space because it is the new and interesting thing. Mm -hmm, and it feels mm -hmm. like it's a natural progression. Yeah, uh, And it's less common to see the data scientists say like, oh, hey, I want to go learn how to... Yeah. Code. And yeah. So uh, I I can see that, but I do like this idea of bringing someone through a bit of the process when they're onboarding, so that they can see and they can really empathize and understand what is happening and and what it means when they are asking for something or when they need something. Right. They can see the repercussions of that. So totally. This has been fascinating. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you would have liked to have talked about? Um, let me see. I think uh, we had chatted before maybe about sort of machine learning on geospatial data um, and why that's yes. pretty cool and why that's exciting. Yes. Um, maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Let's go into that. That's true. Yeah. I totally forgot about that part. And thank you for reminding me. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think I alluded to it like in the very beginning. Um, you know, we've done a ton of, as a community, we've done a ton of machine learning on images. We've done a ton of machine learning on text. We've done a ton of machine learning on tabular data. Um, there is like a lot of really great work being done on machine learning and geography, but it's just not as much. Um, and so I think, you know, geospatial is kind of special in ML in a couple of ways. Um, you know, one, it's not really structured like everything else. So like, you know, text is a, you know, collection of or sequences of words or tokens. Um, images are a collection of sort of structured pixels. Um, all of those things have like, can be reduced to sort of the same form. I think uh, geospatial is a little bit different in that you're dealing with points and lines and polygons, um, 
which, you know, point is just a coordinate, a line is some series of those and polygons are some enclosed thing with maybe some holes. Um, so like trying to figure out ways to work with those different forms of data is, is a little bit different. Um, another thing is different that's a bit different is sort of this idea of uh, like spatial autocorrelation, right? So um, th this idea that kind of in geography, you know, thing everything is similar to everything else, but nearer things are more similar than further things. And um, we have like kind of similar ideas in text, you know, the, the context of a word gives us a lot of information about it. Um, and so we can kind of leverage some of those techniques in, um, in geography as well. Uh, and um, yeah, I think like in the early days of geospatial machine learning, um, because a lot of the problems were in things like trying to predict, um, you know, ground cover, trying to predict land use, um, a lot of the problems got reduced to image learning problems because you could kind of project everything on a map and then, you know, apply your CNN to it and then come up with an answer. Um, I had the, uh, I was able to go to this GI science conference last week, which is kind of this annual uh, conference for academics and geospatial science. It's, um, you know, a big one. And uh, there was a lot of talk about moving sort of away from these image-based approaches and toward more of these knowledge graph approaches um, where, you know, I might have a feature like uh, a road that's on a map, right? Um, and I might have, and maybe that's a highway, one's a highway, one's a road. Um, they kind of look similar, but they, and they have similar semantics, but they're qualitatively different. Um, and then they also look similar to maybe like a river, um, which is, you know, has a very different semantic relationship. And so, you know, image learning doesn't really capture that, but with a knowledge graph, we can kind of understand, you know, these two roads, you know, have a, a, a common parent, um, which is more distant from this, this river. So I think like the real challenge now, and one of the exciting things is trying to figure out sort of how to, to bring those two together. Um, and also dealing with the, the issue of, you know, spatial correlation and, um, you know, the, this pizza restaurant is close to this, uh, you know, Chinese restaurant. Um, and they are similar in some ways, but, you know, the pizza restaurant is also more similar to a pizza restaurant across town that's a little further away, trying to sort of bridge all of those things together. Fascinating. Yeah, it, for me, I remember whenever I think about geospatial data, I instantly think computer vision mm -hmm. and it's a computer vision problem. But when you say that, it makes me understand that, yeah, it's not only that, there are other ways to go about it, right? And so everything being as it is, let's imagine in five years that Iggy does exactly what it needs to do and it is doing a great job of it. What is it that you would like to be spending your time on? Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of things I would love to be doing is, you know, coming up with sort of like uh, sort of a commodity or off the shelf models to deal with geogra ge geography. So, you know, we have Hugging Face is this whole library and company built around uh, transformer models and, you know, sort of being able to pick those off the shelf and apply them to your problem. Um, I would love for us to have something similar to that in geospatial, where I can just pick up this geographic embedding model and apply it to this problem. Um, also, I mean, when you're dealing with geography, just like in a lot of other domains, there, there frequently is this issue of um, interpretability of the results. Um, so, you know, maybe these geographic embedding models could be really powerful, but like, how do we also communicate to uh, you know, the decision maker or the end user that, you know, this pricing model, you know, use this geographic embedding, but really the most important thing here was like, you know, these places are all close to the metro, so they're more expensive. Um, so yeah, there, I think there are a lot of, a lot of things there. Um, another thing that I'm super excited about uh, that we I hopefully will work on soon is um, the idea of geospatial search. So right now, you know, if you go into your favorite oh. search engine and you try to search for things like mountains south of Tennessee, I mean, you can get some information back, but it's not really relevant. The, the, the algorithm does not understand what South of Tennessee means and the geospatial relationships that you're implying. Um, and so, you know, I would love to be working on a search engine that gives you things back that make sense for the questions like that. You know, show me properties that are, you know, within five minutes, we walk to the beach and near fun restaurants. Um, and they, being able to have that as a capability in every, uh, search engine um, just didn't have it work the way that we would expect, which it doesn't today. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. That seems like a no-brainer. And another reason why whenever I talk to Siri, I don't like what she gives me. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't quite figured that out yet. Yeah, and it is, yeah. It is a great problem to be working on. So 
And this has been fascinating talking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time to break down what you're working on, how you're working on it with respect to geospatial data, your path and the path of Iggy, what you're trying to do there and really helping us enrich this data, helping take out that headache for the data scientist. And hopefully because of companies like Iggy, we won't hear that tried cliche that we hear over and over, which is, oh, a data spent data scientist spends 80% of their time just cleaning data and trying to analyze the data. With tools like this, it shouldn't be that way, hopefully, at least not for a little bit longer. And cool. so this has been great. Thanks again for talking to me. Great. Yeah. And thank you so much for, for having me on today. This has been really fun. <laughs>